So you might see a little pop up there. Welcome to those of you who are now joining us on YouTube as well. All right. So uh, Joan, did you want to take a second, introduce yourself as well? Go ahead and take yourself off of mute there. There you go, try that. Mute, okay. Hi everybody, I'm Joan O'Keefe. I'm the environmental educator for Will County. And we've been working with the Conservation Foundation for a while. Um, but we're trying to give it a bigger push now with the rain barrels. And I thank you for coming today. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with you here. We're going to talk today about how to, I shared the wrong one. Hang on. Let's stop that. Try that again. You'd think after doing this for a year, I would have this down. There we go. All right, so we like to talk about keeping the rain where it falls at the Conservation Foundation. And there's two ways that we can do this. First is with rain gardens, and the second is with rain barrels. So those are the two things that we're gonna talk about today. And here we go. So at the Conservation Foundation, our mission, oops, is to protect the health of our communities. So even though, yes, we protect land, we protect water, but in doing so, that actually protects our health as human beings, right? Being outside, studies have shown, helps to make us healthier, both mentally and physically. And having those open outdoor spaces helps in all of that. So that's who we are at the Conservation Foundation. Our headquarters is in Naperville and we serve Kane, Kendall, DuPage and Will counties here in Illinois. So we're not a big multinational type organization. We are very local and we are doing all of our good that we do here, right here in this area. So as we mentioned, conserving open space is very important for our quality of life. So protecting our water quality and our drinking water all super important. Um, those of you who live in Joliet know that there's been a great big issue going on in the city about where to get your water from. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But again, we want to protect our water quality because this is the water that we need to drink and to survive and recreate in and all of that. So also protecting our air quality, habitat for our wildlife, and it's a responsibility that we have to future generations, our kids, our grandchildren, um, so that they can also continue to enjoy all these great opportunities that we have today. Joan and I were talking a little bit before the webinar. My son is 12 and he is super into fishing right now. He loves to go fishing. We went on vacation recently and he spent just about every waking moment fishing. Well, if he's gonna do that, we need to have clean waterways where we can have fish and all of that. So um, again, it's our responsibility to others to make sure that we have all of this going forward. So I'm gonna take you back to school for just a minute and we're gonna talk about the water cycle because when we talk about water conservation, we kind of have to have a sense of where we're going with all of this, what we're doing, where it's coming from, et cetera. So, our water cycle starts up in the clouds, it comes down as rain, and it hits the land. Now, when it hits the land, it can do one of two things. It can either go down into the ground and recharge that groundwater where uh, the, if you have a well at home, if you live in an unincorporated area with a well, that's where your well is pulling from is that groundwater. Um, or it can go across the surface um, if you have uh, an area covered in grass or asphalt or something like that, it will go across the surface and end up in the nearest waterway, where it will then evaporate, go back up into the clouds, and start that cycle all over again. So what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to get it, that rain that comes down, to go into the ground instead of sheeting across, going into our rivers and streams, potentially causing flooding, um, picking up pollutants along the way, so on. We want it to go down into the ground where it will recharge that groundwater, prevent flooding, make sure that we have water 
to continue to enjoy for years and years, et cetera. So basic water cycle in a nutshell there. Now, this is kind of interesting because I mentioned that water can either go down into the ground or it can, it can run off the surface and go into a river or a stream. Now, if we take an area that is covered in forest, like there in the upper left, that's natural ground cover. We've got trees. So the trees, when it rains, are grabbing some of that rainwater, dripping it down into the tree line. Uh, the roots are going to soak it up, et cetera. So when that ha in that kind of situation, only about 10% actually runs off and 50% goes down into the ground. When we have low density residential, so think rural farmland kind of thing, um, that's only 10 to 20% impervious surface. An impervious surface means the water can't soak down into the ground there. So you've got something blocking it. Um, so maybe it's asphalt, maybe it's a building, something like that. So in the, those cases of rural areas, now we've got 20% runoff and 42% going down into the ground. Okay, so a little bit less than if it were just forest, but still pretty good. When we get all the way up to that high density, so we're talking city of Chicago or even some of our um, denser suburban areas, now we've got between 75 and 100% impervious surfaces. That water has no place to go only maybe 15% of it can get down into the ground. And most of it is running off into a river or stream. This is where we're running into issues with flooding because that water that would normally be going down into the ground is staying on the surface and going into one of these areas. So flooding, as we all know, is a bad situation. So we want to do what we can to keep that water where it falls and keep it out of the rivers and streams. So we've known for a long time that this in the city of Joliet that the wells were starting to run dry. And this is what prompted them to need a new water source. So, you know, these articles from the Herald and the Daily South Town, these go back to 2017. So we're talking four years ago we were already starting to talk about these issues. So keeping the rainwater where it falls, and again, keeping it so that it's recharging groundwater areas and things, this is an issue that has real world comp uh, complications to it. So this is a situation, maybe you have one of these drains in your yard, I know I do, um, or you have one in your neighborhood that you've seen. So this is where the storm water goes. So when it falls, instead of flooding your yard or your basement or something, we have these drains that capture the storm water. The water is supposed to go in there and then it gets shunted off either into a waterway or into a treatment plant, depending on where they are. Um, but if you notice, this particular one looks a little bit different than most. Rather than being completely surrounded by grass, you notice it's got those native plants around it. And having those plants right there will slow the water down, preventing erosion and keeping it from um, picking up pollutants and things. It, it will actually help keep those pollutants then out of that storm drain and keep that water in the ground rather than pushing it out again. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about two different ways of keeping rain where it falls today. We're gonna to be talking about rain gardens, similar to the one you see here, and we're also gonna be talking about rain barrels. So let's start with rain gardens. So what is a rain garden? A rain garden is just simply a depression in the ground that's been planted with plants that love water, that you know enjoy being in very wet areas, intentionally directing water into this area, again, because it's kind of a depression in the ground and using that to absorb a bunch of water. It's not a pond, it's not intended to be standing water all the time, but it's intended to give that water a place to go, whether it's going down into the ground because of the deep roots of our native plants or being soaked up by these plants that like lots of water. Um, that's all a rain garden really is. So you can see here, this is kind of a cross section. You can see how 
you got these long deep roots there. You've got the native plants, native plants that don't require fertilizer, by the way, and can help to filter the pollutants. So right there, we're saving money because we don't need to, you know, really, we don't really need to do a whole lot once this garden gets established there. And you can also see here, so if you have a rain garden at home, you can actually sort of attach it to your gutter. So you've got your gutter coming down, you've got the rainwater off your roof going down. In this case, they've got a rock swale. Um, this is similar to the one I actually have at my house. So you've got your downspout going into this rock swale that's directing the water down into this little depression and your plants are there to absorb it. So that way it's not just running across my yard, flooding my yard or going into the local stream that then uh, has flooding there as well. So this way that rain, it sits maybe a day or so, but generally doesn't have standing water in it. So we don't have to worry about mosquitoes and all of that. So if you're gonna design your rain garden, we've got two zones and you can kind of think about it like a pond, even though it's really not, and it's not gonna have standing water for that long, but the center is gonna be your really wet area. And then the B, that lighter color, is going to be more like your shoreline almost. So that's your A is going to have plants that really like it wet, and B is going to have plants that mm, kind of like it wet. So let's take a look at some plants that we can put in here for zone A. We've got world milkweed. So milkweed, as you may know, is a plant that the monarch butterfly depends on for survival. So we always recommend people plant milkweeds. Um, there are many different types of milkweed that are native here in Illinois. Um, some like different conditions than others. So for your rain garden, for the center part of your rain garden, world milkweed is good. Uh, we also have swamp milkweed and butterfly weed we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, foxglove, really, really pretty. And I just think they're so cute. Uh, native plant also really likes it wet there. Some goldenrod. Again, be careful the kind of goldenrod you put in. Some are a little bit weedier than others. This blue stem goldenrod is a very nice, well-behaved type. Um, and goldenrods don't uh, bother your allergies. So I have terrible spring allergies um, and fall allergies and all that. Goldenrod gets kind of a bad rap, but that's because it blooms at the same time as ragweed. Ragweed is a plant that has terrible, terrible pollen. The grains are very small, really exacerbates allergies. But because goldenrod is a little bit showier and it blooms at the same time, people tend to think it's it's the goldenrod. But once again, unless you have a specific allergy to goldenrod, you don't have to worry about it. Bee balm, also called monarda, great, great native plant that the bees and butterflies absolutely love. Um, really a nice plant to have uh, in any of, of your gardens. Black-eyed Susans. This is one that can tolerate a wide variety of moisture content. So um, that can go really on either the A or the B section or just throw it in a, a flower bed that you've got. You know, they're really pretty, pretty easy going as far as flowers go. Um, and same with coneflower. Coneflower is a really common plant that we see a lot. And another one that's really great for rain gardens or any landscape bed. They can tolerate a pretty wide variety of moisture. And then it's always nice to have some grasses in there too. I just love prairie drop seed grass. It has the sort of fountainy effect to it. Um, that's really very pretty in any garden bed. It can be a good edge plant to use to kind of help define the edge of your gardens. Um, just a, a really nice grass to have. Now, if you're going to be in that zone B around the outer edge, it's a little bit drier. Um, again, swamp milkweed. This is another one of those butterfly plants that we like. Uh, very, very pretty flowers. Uh, grows up to be about waist high. Um, as opposed to common milkweed, which I don't generally advise people plant in their yard because that gets like six feet tall and gets kind of weedy. Swamp milkweed is much more better behaved than, uh, than common milkweed. Blue lobelia is a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Um, very striking blue color in there. Marsh blazing star, any of the blazing stars are really nice too. And they are butterfly magnets. Our native pollinators just love blazing stars. So um, if you have a garden where you can put those in, they love it. And white turtle head, this is another one that has super cute little flowers on it. Um, I've got some of this in my rain garden and it's 
it's really, really a nice plant. Blue flag iris, they, this is another one that can go in either the A or the B section. They don't mind wet feet. In other words, they don't mind sitting in water. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you see them out in nature, they're oftentimes right on the water's edge of a stream or a creek or something. So um, iris and just really gorgeous flowers. Golden Alexanders are one. Be a little bit careful with these because they can get in and take over, but another one that the butterflies really seem to like. And then you got your sedges. These are kind of grasses that like it wet. If you have a spot in your yard that you can't get grass to grow because it's too shady and too wet all the time, sedges are great options um, because they actually like it kind of wet. So this is a good grass replacement if you've got areas that are that's difficult for grass to grow because of the amount of water there. So this isn't a great picture, but you can at least see the structure of this rain garden that we have at our office. And we have our downspouts. You can see those little rocky swales there. Our downspouts are directed right into that. That helps the water be directed right into the rain garden. And then we have plants in there. This is an early spring picture, so not everything's come up yet, but I like using this because you can, you can see how it's designed. So we've got that little depression bowl there in the middle and all those downspouts going right into it. So the plants that are there, again, water loving plants, very happy and it doesn't get the standing water. I know that's a big concern that a lot of people have with rain gardens is not wanting standing water there. And we totally agree, we don't want mosquitoes. So rain gardens, when they're designed properly, the water drains out of there fairly quickly because of the plants and things that are there. This is another example before you do this, check with your local municipal rules and regulations. Um, but this homeowner had a, this area that was wet all the time because it was the ditch. It was where the, the uh, local ditch went in front of his yard and it was just wet all the time and muddy. So he put these plants in there. Not all these plants are native, but that's okay. All of the plants that are there are good for wet areas and so they soak up that water and look how much nicer that looks than if it were just a big mud pit. So again, you can't do this everywhere. Some places have rules and regulations about what you can and can't put in different places, but I thought this was a fairly ingenious solution to that, that issue. So we talk all the time about native plants. Why native? Why, you know, aren't all plants the same? As a matter of fact, they're not. So native plants, as we mentioned, are 50 to 60% less costly to maintain than standard vegetation. Part of that's because they have super long roots that I'll show you in just a minute. And those long roots means that they're used to our cold, snowy winters, our wet springs, our hot, dry summers. We have these really wide variety of weather conditions and our native plants are used to that. So by planting native, you are saving yourself time and money because you don't have to baby them and fool them into thinking that they're someplace that they're not. They're also good for our pollinators, our birds, our butterflies, um, all of those benefit by having native plants in your yard. So here you can see the difference in root systems. So Kentucky bluegrass, that's the grass you know most of us have in our yards or some variety of that their roots are only two to three inches long that's why we have to spend all summer watering them because those top two to three inches as any of you with house plants know those dry out really fast but there's still water deeper in the soil so any of our native plants like the buffalo grass over here instead has those long roots that they can still continue to get water out of the soil even after those top couple inches dry out so they're getting nutrients, they're getting water. We don't have to worry about watering them all the time or fertilizing all of that like we do with many of our other plants. So native plants are, are really the way to go in your landscaping. And I know a lot of people think, oh, native plants are just weeds. They're not. There are beautiful flowers and decorative grasses that are native as much as there are exotic ones that we've brought in. So we have our conservation at home program through the Conservation Foundation. With that, we can help advise homeowners for free on things like rain gardens, 
and rain barrels and native plants. So if you have questions on this, feel free to let me know. I'll put my contact information up again at the end, um, but we can definitely help you get started with this. And there's no cost to have us come out to consult. And once you have all your native plants in place, we have a certification program where you get a little sign to put up in your yard that tells all your neighbors, hey, I know what I'm doing here. All right, so once you get all those plants in, you gotta water them in in the beginning. So let's talk about using rain barrels. First off, let's get rid of the misconception here. I'll, I get this question all the time. Hey, isn't it illegal to capture rain? And the answer is no. As a matter of fact, you can capture rain all over the country with the exception of Colorado and Utah. And those go back to some very old ranching regulations back then. But here in Illinois, it is not illegal to capture rainwater. As a matter of fact, many municipalities are encouraging residents to do that as well because of all of the benefits and water conservation benefit from using rainwater. So how does a rain barrel work? Well, first of all, it is a, in our case, the ones that we have here are 55 gallon barrels and that's it. There's no big technology behind them. There's no, you know, this is something that our grandparents and great grandparents used all the way back because they knew the value of doing this, right? Let's use this free resource that we have. So you take your downspout, as you see there on the left, you cut it off and you attach, you have to basically, you have to direct it into the barrel somehow. So the easiest way to do that is with one of those flexible hoses. You just stick that on the bottom of your downspout, direct it into the top of the barrel, boom. When it rains, you get free water. So you wanna have it up on a, either some uh, landscape pavers or up on a pedestal or something because it's gravity fed. So that just gives the water an easier chance coming out of it. So you, and you also wanna be able to get a watering can or a hose or something like that attached to it. So you want it up about six to 12 inches off the ground so that you can get you know, your, your watering can or whatever underneath it and then use the water. So you can see there the rain barrels that we sell have a spigot on the bottom. So you can attach your hose to it and then turn it on and off just like you would right um, you know, at the source of your house. Um, you can get a, a watering can underneath there. You can see also in that the upper right-hand corner there, you can see it's got a screen over the top. That screen keeps mosquitoes from getting in there. So it's small enough that it will prevent mosquitoes from getting in there and laying eggs, which is the big thing that we want. It also keeps debris out of there too. So as it comes off your roof, it may pick up some gravel or leaves or things like that. Very easy to just brush them right off the top of that screen. So a few do's and don'ts with your rain barrel. First off, do place them wisely. You wanna put your rain barrel near where you're gonna use it. So. If you put it at one corner of your house and then you're expecting to be able to use the water at the other end, you're gonna need a really long hose. And as I mentioned, it's gravity fed, so it might be a little bit difficult to get enough water pressure to really get much there. So by placing it near where you're gonna use it, that's the easiest way to do it. So having it at a corner of your house that's near some landscaping or near where you're gonna use it, that's a great idea. And I also wanted to mention, I love that little rain chain there in that picture on the right. It's a really cool way to direct the water right down into your rain barrel. Also, you wanna use the water. Make sure that the water you're collecting, you do something with it. So water your landscaping, your hanging baskets, indoor, outdoor potted plants, right? I use the water out of my rain barrel for almost everything. So anytime I have to water, I've got hanging baskets by my front door. I water it with that. I water my veggie garden with it. Um, I do have an asterisk there. And the, and the reason for that is because you just wanna be careful because we need to consider the water to be non-potable. Um, you don't wanna be spraying it directly on the parts of the plants you're gonna be eating. Um, so if you've got tomatoes growing, you don't wanna be like spraying your tomatoes with it um, just in case you know there, there's anything in the water. Putting it directly into the soil though is fine. 
So as long as you're not spraying the plants themselves or you know, spraying lettuce or something like that that you're using, putting it directly into the soil is fine. Wash your car with it. Wash off your garden tools at the end of the day. Um, whatever, you know, there are a million different uses for the water. Just make sure that the water that you capture, that you're using it. So corollary to that is don't collect more water than you need. I had some people who get so into this and so excited about it. They're like, I'm going to buy five rain barrels and I'm going to put them up all around my house. Well, that's great, but that's 55 times five gallons of water are you actually going to be able to use that much? So we don't want to let it sit around and we really don't want it to be still there the next time it rains. So make sure that you're draining it before it rains. Um, and you also want to make sure that we don't let mosquitoes in. As I mentioned, the rain barrels that we sell have that nice screening on top. Um, I know a lot of people who want to make like DIY ones and that's great. Just make sure that you're doing something to keep mosquitoes out at the top there, because we don't want the water to stagnate. We don't want mosquitoes to be able to get in. Also, because we live in a climate that does get really cold and wintry, we want to make sure that we winterize our rain barrels, right? As anybody who has ever put um, a bottle of water in the freezer or left a bottle of water in your car accidentally in December knows, when water freezes, it expands. If you leave water sitting in your rain barrel, you run the risk of it cracking. So to winterize your rain barrel, there's a couple of things you need to do. First off, you wanna disconnect it from your downspout. You can see my friend here on the right, he's got a uh, diverter. And what that does, the diverter changes whether the water that comes down your downspout goes into your rain barrel or continues its way down and either into the ground or into a storm sewer or wherever else you have it. So if you have a diverter, that's a really easy way to do it, change, your diverter so that it disconnects from your rain barrel. If you just have one of those pieces of, of corrugated plastic, take that off and or redirect it so that it goes out into your yard. Also, drain the rain barrel. So any water that you have left in there, dump it out. Do something with it before it freezes. And leave that valve open. So if any water does get into your rain barrel, it can drain out before it freezes. So really easy, not a huge deal to winterize your rain barrel, but just something you got to remember to do because you don't want to be sad come spring because your rain barrel cracked. All right. And there are some accessories that you can have for your rain barrel as well. When you go to our ordering page, if you order them through the county or through the Conservation Foundation, there are some accessories that are mentioned there. First off on the left, you can see that corrugated plastic. That is a necessity in my opinion. When you hook up your rain barrel, you wanna have it easily directed right into the center of the top there. You don't wanna have it you know, leaking out or splashing out or going anywhere else. So having a uh, piece like that, you can buy though, if you don't buy it as an accessory through the sale, you can buy them at any local hardware store, but that is, in my opinion, a very necessary component of having your rain barrel. You can also buy a stand. As I mentioned, you want to have it up six to 12 inches. So you can buy this stand, you can put it up on landscaping blocks, you can build your own stand if you're handy. However you wanna do it, just make sure you have it up high enough that you can get your watering can underneath or a hose or something like that. And then on the far right, that's one of the, those diverters that I mentioned. So you attach those, in between your downspout and either the corrugated plastic part or another part of downspout or whatever, but that lets you easily switch it so that it goes to your rain barrel or back down the downspout. So nice, easy way to help you winterize it. And then on the bottom there, those are just kind of nice to have. They're not really necessary, but if you wanna grow some plants to kind of hide your rain barrel, there's a netting there on the bottom left. Um, or just some little um, metal things that you can put uh, flowers in, something decorative to decorate your rain barrel with. Rain barrels uh, can also be painted if you are artistic or know someone who is. I've seen some absolutely gorgeous painted rain barrels. So where do you buy all the stuff that we were talking about? Well, the plants 
the Conservation Foundation is having an online plant sale, um, as are many other places around the area. Um, but there's the information for our plant sale. It's coming up. Uh, if you're a member of the Conservation Foundation, you can order a day early on April 30th. Otherwise, it opens to the public on May 1st through 3rd with pickup on May 7th to 8th. Um, you can also find other plant sales that may be near you at that illinoisplants.org. That's the Illinois Native Plant Society. They have a whole list of native plant sales in the area. We also have a couple of nurseries in the area that are really good to buy them from. Um, and if you want to order a rain barrel, there is a link there at the bottom that you can use to order your rain barrel through the Will County uh, Land Use Department. All right, and with that, we can now go ahead and open it up to some questions. There's my contact info as well as Joan's contact info, and there are some very lovely painted rain barrels, as I mentioned, uh, if you are artistic and want to do something like that. All right, so let's go to some questions. Let's see. Pull up. My chat is not pulling up. Okay, here we go. All right, so Bill asked, will the slide deck be made available after the presentation? Um, unfortunately, this presentation is kind of big and it's a little too big for most email systems to handle. Um, but what we will do, as I mentioned, it is recorded and it will be up on the Conservation Foundation's YouTube channel. Um, you should be emailed a link to that afterwards. Um, so if you wanted to watch this again or get information out of it, share it with friends, et cetera, all of that information is there. So, um, so that's my answer to that. Yeah, un unfortunately, I just don't have a good way of, of sharing all of my slides with everybody. Uh, Becky wants to know, do you have a handy list of native plants to Will County? As a matter of fact, I do. And let me pull up something here. I will put it in the chat for you. Um, so the Conservation Foundation has what I affectionately refer to as our yellow brochure, which is our native plant guide. And there we go. Um, I will put this in the chat. So this is a link to a PDF of our native plant guide there. Stop the share. That just makes it a little bit easier for me to see. All right. So hopefully that answers your question. Feel free to download that, take a look. Um, good plants for heavy shade areas close to buildings. Um, well, Peter, to answer your question, a lot's going to depend on your soil type, whether it's really wet, really dry. Uh, one of my favorite low growing shade loving plants is wild ginger or wild geranium. Both of those are really great. Um, I just, I love wild ginger because it spreads a little bit, but in kind of a contained manner, it just fills in really nicely. And it's a great plant with like nice big leaves on it. Um, so, um, but if you have other questions, take a look at that native plant guide there. Um, that's got, it tells you whether the plants like shade or sun. So you can take a look at that. If you have other specific questions, please feel free to email me and I'm more than happy to discuss that with you um, offline or um, over email. But yeah, there's, um, I've also done a webinar that's really good on for shade. And so if you check out our YouTube channel, there are other, um, there's a, a whole video on, on shade loving plants there. All right, Patty says, last spring we had a lot of rain and disconnected the rain barrels because of overflowing. Yeah, unfortunately that happens. Um, yeah, so if you if we have excessive amounts of rain, you know, obviously the, the barrels hold 55 gallons. So depending on where you have it situated, how much of your roof actually goes down into the barrel, um, that can happen. Our barrels have an overflow nozzle on them or, or like an opening. So you can, if if we're predicted to get a lot of rain, you can always hook up a hose to that. And when it gets above a certain point, the water will start to drain off. Um, and so you can direct that then away from your foundation. Um, or 
if it's something that that happens frequently, you know, maybe you have a really large roof and just all of it dumps into this one area, you can actually hook up two rain barrels together using that overflow and then that sort of doubles the amount that your your barrels can hold. So a um, couple different options that you have there um, or even instead of using that overflow, you can always just kind of open it up and and use your hose to direct it to an area where all of that water can go. So there's a few options of how to deal with that. Um, like I said, if it if it happens, you know, once over the course of 10 years, that overflow thing is probably, you know, fine. Um, but if it happens multiple times, you may want to consider putting a second barrel in to handle all of that water there. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, yeah. So that's all the questions that I see for now. Um, did anybody else have any other questions? Joan, did you have anything that you want to add there? Um, yes, I just wanted to say that if you do go to the link um, that was put up earlier, I think I can paste it in here as well. Um, Upcycle is uh, the company that provides the rain barrels and they're made from um, used pickle barrels and they're, they're really nice for several reasons. Um, they're lightweight, they're easy to move around if you do decide to put them in a different spot and I, I just want to tell a little story I have a big cedar house and it's natural and I had the great idea of going to Menards and retrofitting a beautiful wine barrel for a, as a rain barrel. But the problem is it's beautiful it, and um, it's very, very heavy. So I put it up on cinder blocks and um, we got it all working, but I said, oh, I, I really put it in the wrong spot. And so I, I, now I'm going to something like this. It's lightweight. It doesn't, you know, it, when it falls over, it won't kill you. It's, it, it's just a nice, easy to work with plastic barrel. And we, I, we did have, um, we are selling these through Upcycle and um, they need to be picked up at a Will County Spring event. Um, if you do go to buy one, you'll see the remaining two spring events. This uh, next one's coming this Saturday, April 17th in Joliet, and the address will be on the Upcycle website. And then there's one in May on May 15th in Shanahan. Um, you will also get a confirmation a um, couple days before the pickup date from us to just say, you know, we're going to be there with your barrel. So it's pretty easy. And I think um, we had an earlier event this year in Mokina and we did have a couple come and they had already had two of these rain barrels and they were buying a third, but they went slowly over time. They got used to using them and they found they're kind of hooked on this. So I know some people love them. Some people get them and don't quite use them right away, but um, now that I'm used to mine, I know how to collect the water and save on my water bills in the summer. So if you have any questions, uh, you can email me as well. Absolutely. And I also use one of these rain barrels from Upcycle as well. And I've, ha I've had it for a number of years and they are easy to use. They may seem a little intimidating at first, but they are truly very easy to use and it's free water right? And so it's better for your plants than softened water um, that we might get out of our tap or that might come out of that little spigot on the side of our house. Um, but it's, it's free water. It's better water. It's got more nitrogen and nutrients and things like that. Rainwater is just healthier for our plants in general. But these barrels are, and I've looked at a lot of them, they are some of the best made and the least expensive ones. And honestly, the benefit of buying them from a sale like Will County Land Uses is, is you get to save on the shipping. Um, the manufacturer used to deliver them himself. And so the shipping was, was low, but with COVID and because of everything going on, he just can't do that anymore. So the shipping costs have gone up a little bit because now he's got to pay FedEx or wherever um, to send them. So you can save yourself those shipping costs by ordering them through the land use site. Um, but yeah, they truly are some of the most well-constructed barrels. And I've talked with Rich who owns Upcycle. He's a great guy, nice locally owned business right there out of Morris. Um, 
and they get these barrels. These barrels are what are used to ship things like peppers and pickles and olives and things from Greece and Italy. And when they get here, they can't be reused. You know, U.S. law says they they can't be re, they reused. They've got to be thrown out. So instead, Rich takes them, washes them out really well. And the nice thing is because they had food in them, they are already food grade. So you don't have to worry about there being weird chemicals and things like that in them. But Rich makes sure to wash them out really, really well and drill the holes and put the fittings on them. And the mosquito screen that he uses on the top is super high quality. It's like the best in the industry. And um, like I said, if you were to buy something similar at one of the big box stores, you're going to pay twice as much for it and, and probably not even going to be as good. So these are, are really, truly some of the best rain barrels out there that I've seen. So um, this is, this is a, good, a good way for people to get them and to use them. So, all right, so we had a couple more questions come in here. Uh, Patty says, if a storm's predicted, can I use your white valve and leave it in bypass mode? You absolutely can. That, that is another option for sure. So having that, it, you have lots of options if, if overflow is an issue. So um, whatever works the best for you at the time, that's what you should do. So, um, all right. Well, if there are no other questions, that is all I have. But you are absolutely welcome to contact me if you have questions on rain gardens or rain barrels, contact Joan. Um, but with that, I'm going to wrap up here. Any last words from you, Joan? Just thank you for attending and uh, thank you so much, Jamie. Absolutely. One, well, thank you all for being here today and we hope to hear from all of you soon. Thanks everybody. Goodbye.